Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, we offer you a taste of the 21 Hats live event we held in Fort Worth two weeks ago. It's a different kind of event where there are no speakers, only participants. It's pretty much a three-day peer group session for business owners where we share challenges and insights and make connections. There are 25 of us, including most of our podcast regulars. We voted on topics that we wanted to discuss, and then we discussed them. We visited Laura Zander's Madeline Tosh Yarn Factory and learned that making yarn is surprisingly complex. And we wandered the somewhat eccentric Deadwood meets Disneyland streets of Fort Worth's Stockyards District. But for me, the highlight was an exercise that Chris Hutchinson of the Trebuchet Group facilitates. He calls it a fishbowl because the idea is to have an owner stand up and expose everything about a specific challenge that he or she is confronting. That's asking a lot, but of course, that's what we do on this podcast. And fortunately, we had one owner who was gracious enough to agree to reveal all and to answer any question. And that owner was, well, it was me, actually. The truth is, this was a priceless opportunity for me to get some feedback from a focus group of smart entrepreneurs who were already familiar with 21 Hats. Here's how it worked. First, Chris, our facilitator extraordinaire, asked me to explain my biggest challenge, which was pretty easy. I need to find more people like those in that Fort Worth conference room. While I've developed several promising revenue streams, I barely cracked $100,000 in revenue last year. After explaining my challenge, I took questions from the group. Then they split into four smaller groups that spent 10 or 15 minutes brainstorming ideas, which they then took turns presenting to the group as a whole. Receiving their advice and feedback was a little like what I imagined attending my own funeral would be, with people saying nice things about me, almost as if I wasn't in the very same room. But it also felt a bit like an intervention, with some tough love confrontation thrown in as well. It even got emotional at points, mostly because a couple of the owners were kind enough to say that had it not been for 21 Hats, their businesses might not have survived the pandemic. That was moving to here, to say the least, but of course that alone doesn't mean 21 Hats has a sustainable business model. In the end, what did I take from the exercise? A lot of goodwill, a lot to think about, a lot of offers to help, and several checks. Oh boy. We recorded the whole thing, and if you have any thoughts after listening to it, please send them my way. As always, our hope is that these weekly conversations, brought to you by our principal sponsor, The Great Game of Business, We'll let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, The 21 Hats Morning Report, which Inc. Magazine named the best newsletter for business owners and which you can subscribe to for free at 21hats.com, where you can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes and lots of other articles and interviews. The episode is titled, I Need a Business Model. So I'm Chris Hutchinson from the Trebuchet Group, and I'm glad to be here helping facilitate this amazing amount of knowledge, wisdom, and care. So Lauren, uh, tell us about your challenge or problem in a nutshell. You know, what, what are we doing here? My challenge is to meet more people and rope in more people like the people in this room. I've been doing this for about three years now, trying to build a community of business owners who compare notes, who share their wins and losses, who learn from each other and making some progress, although my growth has kind of plateaued over the last year, and I need to figure out a real business model, which I have not successfully done yet. I've been experimenting with a couple of revenue streams, but I don't have a sustainable business model as of yet. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so you notice the last thing you said was really the most important, right? A sustainable business model is what I hear is the challenge. So let's go ahead and put that down. What's working right now in your model? Well, from a financial standpoint, not much, but I get great feedback and support from people like the people in this room who I think are getting something out of what I'm doing, which is a daily email newsletter, Mm -hmm. which summarizes the most important news of the day for business owners, a weekly podcast that is a peer group conversation with a group of business owners talking about what's going on in their businesses, a monthly Zoom call, and uh, this is the second live event that we've done, and I hope to do a lot more, assuming these people are having a good time and getting something out of it. So how do these things connect to your sustainable business model? They're all related in the sense that they're all building a community. They're all ways that 
business owners are coming together to compare notes, share their experiences, and learn from each other. So having build that community that you want to have. Yes. What's not working right now in your sustainable business model? I'm not making enough money to pay my bills without the fact that I have a wife who has a real job. So I'm, if you're hearing the screechy scratch or you're not hearing me, I'm, I'm writing things down. So in terms of the not making enough money, what would be enough? Well, I have, um, I guess I have a series of goals. The first goal might be to make as much money as I used to make as an employed journalist. Okay. But that would mean that I'm still a one-man show. I would love for this to grow beyond that and be able to hire a few people who would help me do what I do, allow me to stop working seven days a week and, you know, work on the business instead of in the business and do some things that I used to do when I had a big media company supporting me, um, but that I haven't been able to do as a one-person operation. What, what kind of things, for instance? Well, uh, when I was at Forbes, I brought Bo Burlingham over from Inc., and he had written the book Small Giants, and we created an annual Forbes Small Giants list where we kind of listed 20 small businesses of the year. There was an application process. We picked really cool businesses. We had an event where they came together and was kind of building a community there. Unfortunately, Forbes didn't find it as interesting as I did, but it was successful in the sense that when we first started, of course, nobody had heard of it. So we had to solicit, uh, we had to go find these companies. By the fourth year we did it, we had hundreds of applications. People really cared about it. And it brought in like $4 million a year in revenue for Forbes. That would be okay. $4 million revenue would be okay for you? Well, I'm not assuming that. I mean, <laughs> Forbes had something to do with that, so I'm not expecting to be able to do that myself. Okay. Um, but yeah, that would be okay. That would be okay. Is there any last thing that you can think of before we get the questions from our august group of business owners here that it would be good for them to know to help ask you ask the right you kind the of right questions? questions. Uh, you know what? I trust these folks. I'm eager to hear whatever questions they have. Okay, great. You go ahead and write some questions down. And then uh, go to the mic, say your name and the company, and then share your questions. So we're going to encourage you to ask open-ended questions that help us all think, especially Lauren, about what's happening and what are the factors that are going to be able to help him be more successful in having a sustainable business model. So how about we go over first? Hi, it's Jennifer from SB Expos and Events. Lauren, my question is, what are your current streams of revenue now? On the podcast, I have a sponsor, The Great Game of Business, and um, they pay me a monthly fee. I uh, completed a one-year contract, and we're on the second year now. With the newsletter, I've never put up a paywall, but that's something that I'm considering. I did a couple years ago ask people to pay on a voluntary basis, and um, out of about 6,500 uh, subscribers. I got about 100 people who did start paying me. They pay me either uh, a monthly fee or an annual fee for the newsletter. And about 30 or so pay me to be part of a, a monthly forum, a Zoom call, where we just talk about what's going on in everybody's uh, business. So those are the uh, those are the revenue streams at the moment. Okay. Thanks, Jen, for next question. Kurt Wilkin with Hire Better. My question is, in what ways have you leveraged this group? You've got quite a few folks who really love you and appreciate what you've done for them and their careers. How have I leveraged this group? You know, I wouldn't say I've been terribly successful at doing that, except that you guys are all successful, influential people. And I have periodically asked everybody to spread the word as best they can. And a lot of you have managed to do that. I know word of mouth is my best marketing. And when other entrepreneurs hear from the folks like the people in this room, uh, that the podcast or the newsletter has been valuable, that's tremendously helpful to me. Um, so it's happened a little bit informally, probably not as I have done as much with that as I should. Okay, great. Thanks. Next. Sarah Siegel with Siegel Communications. Lauren, um, when a lot of aspiring actors go to LA or New York, they give themselves two years to be successful or they pack it in and get a real job. What's your plan? 
<laughs> um, well, you know, I'm in some ways I consider myself fortunate being a slightly older than usual entrepreneur. Uh, I have two kids. They are both out of college. Their tuitions are paid for. Um, my mortgage is paid for. Uh, so I don't have the immediate fear that if this doesn't work, I'm going to be lost. So I have not set a deadline date. Um, it's kind of how long I enjoy doing this and, uh, how long I go on feeling as though this is a worthwhile enterprise that has some prospect of succeeding. I don't know what the exact time frame for that would be. Thanks. Next question. Paul Downs, Paul Downs Cabinet Makers. Uh, Lauren, what distribution channels are you using and which of those platforms is most likely to result in rapid growth? Are you talking about social media? Well, yeah. Like, do you, here we are doing a podcast. Is it also going to be on YouTube? Is it, you know, like whatever? What, what, how does the content go out? The newsletter is on Substack. And Substack is actually very helpful in terms of spreading the word. You know, they have a huge audience. They do their best to get people to recommend to other Substacks. And I've benefited uh, from that. With the podcast, uh, you know, we p- post it on a platform called Spreaker that nobody's ever heard of, but it's distributed through Spreaker to all the places that you have heard of. Uh, not YouTube. We don't do it in video. We just do audio. Uh, I do try to promote what we do on LinkedIn. I think that it, of all the social media channels, that's the one that has an audience that makes sense for me. That's probably it. Okay. Thanks. Next question. Hi, it's uh, Ami Kassar from Multifunding. Lauren, my friend, what is your greatest strength and how does that translate into your greatest weakness? We're getting personal here. <laughs> I don't know if I'm smart enough to answer the second part of that. I think my greatest strength is that I've been doing a version of what I'm doing now for more than 20 years. And, you know, a lot of journalists are not satisfied being on the small business beat. They are looking to move up the food chain. And if they're working on the small business desk at the Wall Street Journal, or, you know, even if they're at Inc. Magazine, their career goals often want to take them somewhere else. I discovered this beat and kind of fell in love with it and decided to stick with it. And, you know, (laughs) you do something for 20 years, you got to get a little bit better at it. And you start meeting people and making connections. And I don't know if there's anybody else who's put this amount of time into covering this particular beat. So I feel like I know people and I know things about these types of businesses that most journalists don't know. I mean, you know, I work, I work with some of the smartest business journalists in the world at the New York Times, at Forbes, and even at Inc. And I can tell you the percentage of them who realize that people like you routinely borrow against your homes to support your business. I mean, nobody knows that. That's my biggest advantage. I think I I know this beat in a way few people do. How does that translate into my biggest disadvantage? And I would need some time to think about that. You, you might have a better answer to it than I do. Well, if somebody's doing something for a very long time, and that's what they know, how might that be a disadvantage? I guess it's possible you start to take things for granted. And some, things become so familiar to you that you think everybody knows it, and you don't realize what you know that others don't. But I'm not sure I've gotten to that point yet. That's great. Let's see. Next question. Sean Bussey with Kinesis. Two-part question. How do you feel about sales and how do you feel about self-promotion? <laughs> sales, if you had asked me that question before I started doing this, I would have told you, I can't even imagine trying to do that. I got to stay <laughs> as far away from that as possible. What I found is that I feel I've done the best I've done in terms of growing my audience by having direct conversations with people. I wouldn't say I'm good at marketing per se, but I am good at having a conversation one-on-one or in a small group where I talk about what I'm doing and why I think it matters. And I think I'm good at capturing the authenticity that comes through in the podcast and and the newsletter. And um, 
because I'm, you know, would never be comfortable with a hard sell. I think that that has worked for me. What was the second part? Self-promotion. Self-promotion. You're seeing it on display right now. I'm as uncomfortable as I could possibly be. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Excellent. Next question, please. Liz Picarazzi, City Ben. So, Lauren, I'm curious if you have ever considered monetizing your moderating skills or your storytelling discussion skills. I've considered it. I've had trouble getting uh, other organizations that would pay the money to consider it. And kind of an interesting challenge in the sense that I've done a lot of that. I've done it at a lot of high profile events for business owners. They usually don't offer to pay me. I always ask. And then I'm left with a decision. Well, it would be nice to get paid for doing this. I think I should get paid for doing this. But if they're not going to pay me, I still get the opportunity to present what I do and expose what I do to a large audience of the kinds of people I'm trying to reach. So, yeah, I'll do it for nothing. I haven't figured out how to break out of that. Okay, thanks. Next question. Michelle Wyatt, St. John's Rivership Company. Uh, Have you considered ways to segment your target audience? Oh, that's a great question. Well, how segmented is your audience already? It's not segmented. Um, I'm looking for anybody who is trying to build a business and feels as though they would benefit from being part of a community and part of a conversation with other people on similar journeys. Honestly, I do worry that there's the potential that I don't go deep enough in any one particular area. I remember before I started 21 Hats, I had a conversation with a manufacturer who said to me, somebody who I had covered, who had become something of a friend. I was telling him what my plans were. And he said, I'll be honest with you. You're a friend of mine. I'm going to give it a shot. But what's most valuable to me is being in a community with other manufacturers. That's the support that I am looking for. And if you're creating a community of people with more general business concerns, I don't know if that's going to do it for me or not. I might put my time into just manufacturers. So I, you know, as a one person operation, I haven't figured out how to go deeper in certain areas with a team. If I ever get to the point where I can hire that team, I would love to figure out a way to, you know, represent more of those 21 hats and go deeper in areas so that people like that friend of mine who is not part of the community would find enough uh, here to be, uh, to have it be worth his time. What do we have? I'm going to phrase my question slightly differently. This is Kurt. Uh, yes, this is Kurt Wilkin. And my question is going to start with, uh, Lauren, you're a badass. The number of people that you've impacted over the years is in the thousands. The number of people I've met here this week is over 25 people who have had such an impact from you over the uh, course of their careers is phenomenal. So you're making an absolute impact. I want you to know that. So part of my, that leads to my question, which is how are you leveraging the folks in your sphere that are more Perhaps influential publishers, uh, your uh, experience at Inc. and Forbes, authors like Bo Burlingham or Doug Tatum, famous friends. How are you uh, leveraging those folks? I'm not. Well, that was easy. <laughs> I didn't want a yes or no question, but okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a great idea. All right, please. Next question. Justin Jordan, Essential Ingredients. Lauren, who are your competitors and what are they doing very well that you would like to emulate or improve on? You know, this gets back to what I was saying before about journalists not wanting to make a career on the small business beat and looking to move off it as quickly as possible. In part for that reason, I really don't feel as though I have a lot of direct competitors. Now, I've been covering business owners long enough to know to be skeptical. Anybody, anytime somebody says I have no real competition. So let me acknowledge that. But I don't think there's anybody who's quite putting two things together, which is, the kind of peer group community with the media aspect, the content aspect of what I do. So my competitors include, you know, publications like Inc. or the Wall Street Journal, Entrepreneur Magazine on one side, peer group organizations like EO, YPO, Vistage on the other side. I don't think any of them quite put it all together the way I am trying to do here specifically with the experience that I have and the knowledge that I have of 
what you folks go through trying to to build a business. So I, I think I do offer something that's different. There are, you know, great organizations out there that are offering specific pieces of this, and they're really good at it. I spent years at Inc. Magazine. That's where I was first exposed to this. It was a great experience for me. I learned a lot there, especially from Bo Burlingham. I met some of the people in this room there, which was really important to me. They're capable of doing really great work, although I don't think they've really figured out an, a digital strategy. There are other organizations like, I mean, Vistage is a fantastic organization. I think, you know, there are people in this room who've had tremendous experiences with, with Vistage. There are some people who've had less happy experiences, but they, they offer a, a, a great service. I can't compete with that. I would love to at some point, um, but I certainly don't now. I think that's what I got. That's good. Another question? Uh, Michael Russo with Brand Russo. Um, it seems like with the rise right now of coaching in the world and people seeking out answers and there's so many books and there's so many things, there is a need for really clean differentiation with your audience. And do you have a brand promise? And if so, what is it? Um, the question I would put that in is, I am the only blank that does blank. And have you defined that? I'm reluctant to say only, but my goal is to be the only only media company that does a really good job offering both content and community in one place. That's the goal. I think, um, you know, for a one person shop, I think I've had some success with that, but there's a, there's a long ways to go. Okay. We have time for a few more questions. Hi, Lauren, Dr. Trisha Graff, executive advisor. Could you tell us about how you determine your pricing model? for events such as this and for the mastermind? My monthly CEO forum. Actually, the, the way I did it was to talk to the CEO forum group and ask them for advice uh, as to what they would be willing to pay and what they suggest I charge. When it came to the events, the advice I got from people in that particular Zoom call was you need to charge a real price because for us, it's not so much a matter of the money, it's the time. And if we're going to spend three days at an event, we want to know we'll be with other people who are serious about this, somebody who is on a similar journey that I can uh, learn from. Those people on that call told me that I should probably charge about $5,000. I um, didn't quite have the nerve to, to do that. I kind of cut that roughly in half. And it was interesting because the three or four people who are most vocal insisting that I charge $5,000 for an event that runs from Wednesday dinner through Friday lunch, none of them actually came <laughs> when I scheduled the event. But that was the process that I went through to, to come up with the price. I, I, cut it, <laughs> I cut it in half. I came up with a number that I was comfortable with. I ran it by a bunch of people. About half of them said they would not pay that. Half of them said they would. So I gave it a shot and uh, happily was able to pretty much sell out the two events I've done so far. All right. So um, we're really close to the place. I can feel it in the room where people are like, I know what I want to share. I want to, I want to see if that solution that I'm thinking of is really the right solution. I can feel it. So I'm wondering if there's any other, in the minute and a half we have left, any other questions that are really can help us understand the situation rather than what maybe he has tried. Go ahead. John Kelch, Chesham Security. Can you describe what your ideal audience is in your mind? It's you guys, it's, it's business owners who are at any stage of the process, uh, whether they're getting started and trying to figure things out or whether they've been doing it for decades, had a certain amount of success and are looking to share some of what they've learned. One of the things I believe I've learned during the last couple of decades of uh, talking to folks like you is that you know every, everybody's journey is different and i don't know that there's any one particular way to prepare yourself for that journey i think getting an mba can be helpful but it doesn't really prepare you for what it really takes to build a business i think maybe the best preparation is to be number two on somebody else's journey for a little while and see what they go through but I, i'm looking for people 
who are on that journey and believe that the best way that they can open their mind to other options is by meeting with other people on similar journeys. And I'm hoping to bring them together. Okay. Hi, I'm Dave Stern with the Inside Track. And my question is, you mentioned earlier that you considered doing a paywall. I wanted to ask why you didn't move forward with that thought. And then the the other question is, out of the 100 people that have uh, paid for the subscription to your newsletter, have you asked them what motivated them to voluntarily give you money? I I have not thus far implemented the paywall because I didn't want to restrict the growth. I wanted to make it as easy as possible for somebody to subscribe. Same thing with the podcast. I'm rethinking it a little bit because I'm an idiot. (laughs) Yes, that's my fault. It's a normal business owner thing that things interrupt you all the time. So you're good to go. Perfect. I'm rethinking it because my growth has plateaued anyway. I have, a, you know, I think a significant number of readers for the newsletter and uh, people who download the podcast every month. And I'd like to think that if I put it behind the paywall now, I would get a much higher percentage than I got on a voluntary basis. I, yes, I have anecdotally asked people. Actually, I, I really haven't had to ask much. People often volunteer it. Um, as recently as last night, someone told me, someone in this room told me, that they weren't sure their business would have made it through the pandemic if they hadn't had the information in the newsletter every day that helped them figure out things like how to get PPP money. Um, so I, I think I know why people sign up when they do. I don't know how many will sign up if I force them to pay. And that's the, the big question. Beautiful. I would love to keep asking questions. And I know there's an itch to say, Let's get this next step. So we're going to number off really quickly, get into four groups. And in that group, it's thinking out loud together about having a response. Um, And again, we'll just do those one at a time where it'll be a caution, like watch out for this. Here's a success tip. As you're going, here's something that could really help you, especially if you have experience around that. And then the next step is what would be a good thing for Lauren to do next on this journey? He shared where he is and where he wants to go. So we're going to look for your advice on that. Okay, so at this point, we did, in fact, break up into four small groups. Chris gave everyone 10 to 15 minutes to kick around ideas and formulate the advice that each group would then present when we reconvened as a whole. And that's where we pick up now with Chris. Are we ready to uh, provide some input? Please get up in front of the microphones. We're going to do one group at a time. So come on up and share your advice which is going to be a caution, a next step, or a success tip. Hi, I'm Noelle Matawi from Matawi Tile Works. Our our big success tip is get paid. Do the paywall and get paid for your moderation. We think you undervalue what you bring. Second thing is one of the strengths you have is your curiosity and literally your personality and how that displays. And we feel like actually a, a visual... Um, YouTube is something you should consider because you would come through. Thank you. Okay, so we have the things we got is uh, get paid for paywall moderation and consider visual medium because you'd come across. Am I just supposed to respond to these? Uh, you don't need to. Good. But you can, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> At the end, you can say, here's what I'm going to do about them because, you know, the best thing to do when you're given advice is just say, thank you. That's what I did. You did. All right, next. All right, Sean Bussey with Kinesis representing group four. We were universal. We all believe it's a sales problem and that fundamentally your superpower, which is editorial and research and digging, you're not dedicating enough time to sales. And we actually think you need help with that. That's our advice. Okay. You need to bring somebody in from the outside. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. Next. Uh, we would echo the sales issue, um, but we were suggesting that you hire a salesperson on commission only, where they get paid when they are successful in monetizing your content and helping you monetize. We also think that you might need to look at similar models to yours. For example, Vern Harnish with Gazelles. I have some further thoughts. 
it's amazing to me that, Lauren, you've been in this space for 22 years and you still see yourself as merely a facilitator of people talking to each other, whereas you actually have expertise, deep expertise, in what it takes to run a business. And your content, both in the podcast, website, they don't really reflect that. You're always deferring to somebody else. And unfortunately, that's not a very efficient way for people to re- to get interested in you and your operation. So one thing I thought of was that when we do the podcast, if someone listens to the whole thing, they're going to get something out of it. But what you never do is here's the lessons for today and inserting yourself into the process, not merely as an editor. You could wrap up the podcast with here's several other episodes we did on the same thing. Here's some resources. In other words, start to become a more easily accessible and efficient resource for people who need the information you've got to get it in a different, more digestible format. I think sales is a problem, but I think that part of it is also your offering. It's got a unique configuration that is not easy for people to easily digest. Thank you. I I think you're absolutely right. I'm much more comfortable doing it this way than the way you're describing because I spent 22 years talking to business owners It's not the same thing as 22 years building a business. And when I have conversations with folks like you guys who have been in the thick of building a business for an extended period of time, I am always reminded how much I still have to learn. Lauren, you're struggling to build a business right now. And if I succeed, I may one day be able to do what you're suggesting I do. I'm... I'm not rejecting your advice. I appreciate it, and I'm going to give it a lot more thought. But I just wanted to respond that you've described it very accurately. It is how I feel, and I'm going to think about it. All right. Thanks. Next piece of advice. Kurt Wilkin, representing Group 3. I'm going to lead with an example, and I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and the biggest salesperson for them is often them. No one can tell their story better than them. No one has the same passion that they do. Someone once gave me the advice when I wrote the, my book to, to get me out there and be more comfortable about something I was uncomfortable with, which was being self-promoter, was, Kurt, fake it till you feel it. I, I'm going to repeat what I said before. You're a badass, and uh, you need to fake that till you feel it. And when they said uh, you need sales, which is absolutely true, we're going to take it a step further and say promotion. Somebody that's a promoter, maybe someone to partner with you to be a promoter of, for Lauren. Lauren's mouthpiece is advocate. And... As I said before, there are people that you've met in the past that are big fans of yours that you could leverage. We had an idea of could you leverage the small giant name and have the small giant awards again? So things like that, that you're a connector, connecting for your purpose as opposed to other people's purpose for a change. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Next. Uh, Michael Russo again. Um, I'm with group one. The more I think about this is like you really need some deep thought into this and really get some advisors and experts and whether it's hiring or just really picking people's brains to come up with a plan that's significant. Because I think there's so many ideas. Everybody here is excited about you and what you provide. And I think when I asked you, I'm the only blank that does blank, that's a really deep question. For us at our agency, it's important because we want to get to the root of what you do that's special. You know, and just quickly, it was, you know, I'm the only business moderator or community builder that has what you just said, 22 years of speaking to other businesses. That is something unique and that is something to build upon and your advice is valuable. And so we talked about the YouTube thing or these two things, being the expert in the room, being that thought leader and building on that and leveraging your base here with that plan. I think there are so many opportunities. Thank you. Okay. We have time for a couple more. Go ahead. Liz Pecorazzi with CityBin. So Lauren, I pitched you an idea for getting sales in a particular area a little while back. Talked a little bit about it. And it was to get some sort of um, facilitation or moderating event that you can sell to EOs and any sort of networking sort of group like that. And I think that if you were to present a group like that with like a, an, an evening with Lauren Feldman or something where you are facilitating a conversation that people can watch that's worth a lot. And I'll tell you why. People like us that do EO, you pay $8,000 a year. We all, 200 of us at the New York City chapter, 
they have a gigantic budget for learning events that almost never gets fully spent. And, and I know this because I've kind of dug around a little bit. If I could vote in my EO on who I would bring in as like a learning event person, it would be you. And there could be like hundreds of chapters that feel the same way. They're going to just keep writing you the checks because they, they know they need what you have. But like emotional about this for some reason, but I think it's that like we're not the people that have the checkbook to pay you for what you do. But in EO or any of these, you just get out there with what you do. You've got a huge audience is what I'm saying. And they have huge budgets, even more importantly. Like line items everywhere, learning events, you just go in and grab it. Thank you so much for that. One question. When you're describing this as a, an evening with Lauren Feldman, uh, are you literally exactly. suggesting that I would be – the speaker and talking about no, my experience or, no. or facilitating a conversation? You would facilitate a conversation about something that the chapter found interesting that was based on actual like expertise. So when not talking about you and your career, that is very interesting, but I wouldn't pay for that actually. Neither would I. I would like you to facilitate really great discussions and I want to be in the audience and I'll know that everyone else will want to be there because a lot of the events suck. Like, I would say at least 50% of the events I go to really suck. And that's why I'm like, every time at one of those EO events, I think Lauren should do this instead. I'd rather have something like that. And I don't think I'm alone. You've got a really very specific skill set. The people have money that they're waiting to spend. I'm serious. Thank you, Liz. Nice advocacy. We have one more thought, and then we'll wrap and see which of these activities that Lauren would be willing to commit in front of us and make it work. Kurt Wilkin, again, I echo uh, Liz's statement about EO and YPO and other organizations like that. You can pull together their their members and you facilitate the discussion. Our uh, other specific suggestion is that could we white label your content for trade associations, associations, universities, YPO, EO, other groups, white label it so it's it's their content for a hefty fee. I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay, Lauren, how are you feeling with uh, the group here? I feel great. I know that these folks are putting a lot of thought into this, and I couldn't appreciate it more. All right. So uh, we'll have you go over with the red marker and outline which one or two, maybe three, but I don't want to uh, saddle you too much so you can see what, what you're going to commit to. Commit in... Well, commit to doing exploring. Exploring. <laughs> commit to exploring. Okay, commit to exploring. Now you can exploring. I mean, if you could commit all the way to do it, that'd be perfect. You want to read them as I underline them? I, I, will, I will read them, yeah. So uh, Lauren is accepting, uh, let's see, we'll see how much you commit to. Getting paid and paywall or moderation. Not paid in moderation, paid for moderation. Get help with the sales problem. All right. There's get advisors and create a plan, which is part of that help. Okay, so here we go. The marker is capped. We have uh, cell moderation, EO, et cetera, which goes along with that passionate uh, expression by Liz, white level of content, get paid, get help. So how, when are you going to come tell us about that, uh, the progress you'll be making on that, Lauren? Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna list to enlist the help of the people in this room before I actually do it and pursue some of these conversations a little bit further. So... Some of these people will hear from me before I do anything. I'm going to give this a lot of thought, and I'm going to try to put myself in a place where when we gather again next year, I will be able to report back that I have actually done most of what I've committed to trying to do. <laughs> that's as, If that's all the commitment we got, we, we can get it. Um, I know everybody here is going to be excited about it, and everybody listening is going to be wanting to support you and, and helping you help us. And I just want to say... I so appreciate this. I will point out one thing. I've acknowledged that I don't have a real business model, but let's please note that I've actually managed to get a bunch of people to pay to come here and give me advice. So <laughs> I'm not completely without <laughs> thoughts about a business model, okay? Uh, but mostly I just want to thank you. And then just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in again to offer more advice. And the session continued. A few thoughts, uh, John Kelch. 
one, I don't think you're you're um, you're asking directly enough to support you. You know, at the end of your podcast, you've got the little where if you got anything out of this, you know, here's how you can. Uh, I would just get rid of that um, and more directly say, you know, ask for ask for people to support you. I know of another podcast and they've grown like crazy in the last few years. I gladly pay them twenty dollars a month, uh, and the reason I do that is the way they ask me to do it. So I think that you have a valuable audience and you're just not quite monetizing enough. You're not being direct enough about the ask. The other thing is tiers. So I think you can have um, different tiers of uh, offering. So, you know, for five bucks a month, you get very minimal $20 a month. Maybe you get access to your mastermind group or whatever those might look like. So I think there's differentiation where you can increase the um, how much folks are paying you. Cool. Thank you. Paul. All down. You remind me of a classic problem that I've seen a million times, which is someone who's a superb craftsman and wants to do great work and is horrified at the idea of actually promoting yourself. And you, you, you just don't see that in today's world, that's not a winning approach. That in order to really accomplish what you want to build communities, you have to push yourself out there a little bit. And this goes back to another basic business principle, which is you don't succeed by doing more of what you're good at when what you need is to get better at what you're bad at. And that could be you doing it or somebody else doing the thing you're no good at, but you really have to get your head around self-promoting, being an expert, putting out a book just like, uh, like you heard suggested a second ago. That would be an awesome thing. People are dying to get access to what you know and you're just afraid to have it pass out as a Lauren Feldman production or product. And you're always trying to push it down to people who are contributing as authentic, which it is. But there's also value in packaging and in presentation that will give you, at the end of the day, a larger amount of community if you can get your head around improving the thing you're not doing well. There you go. I hear you. Thank you. Yeah, actually, this is a this is a setup. It's an intervention. <laughs> we're all here to help you get your needs out into the world. So, consider me intervened. <laughs> so, I believe that um, if you can segment your audience a lot better, it will actually grow. So, for example, you mentioned the industry, but I also think geography. Number of years that they've been an entrepreneur, the size of their company, and whether or not they're a founder or a leader. So if you can segment further, not only would it help you um, target content better, but you can find sponsors for that specific area or that specific industry or that specific target. For example, pick on Barbara. If someone's been an entrepreneur for 20 plus years, that would be an awesome target for her to start talking about an exit strategy. And she might want to say to you, hey, I would love to write an article targeting these people and then be able to contribute better and then segment the audience better. And then if and when you get to the point where you do do multiple conferences across the country and you decide to come to lovely Florida, then you can segment um, and target the people that live in Florida and really push for them to come to your events. So there's a lot of advantages to doing better segmentation. And that information is free. You can ask for it when people sign up for the newsletter. And it's valuable to you. It may not be money, but it will be valuable for you to help promote to other sponsors what you'll do um, or to promote your future events, what you'll do to those targeted industries or audiences for you as well. There's a lot of great advice there. Thank you. I have to think about this. I don't know how much this is reality and how much of it is just an excuse, but I am working seven days a week now and I feel as though my time is best spent doing things that I know how to do and getting to a certain point. I get one more. Well, I'm anonymous. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned that um, someone told you that 21 hats had uh, gotten them through the pandemic. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't expect this. Please cut it. Um, <laughs> I, I can cut it later. But, but so, thank you. Anyway, sorry. Give me a second. I'm one of those people. Uh, that you uh, and your panel had also gotten through the pandemic. So, you know, fast forward, I'm able to, you know, have a job that I love and I've had for many years. 
and uh, also, uh, you know, employ nine people. So um, I wanted to, <laughs> this is so embarrassing, I wanted to thank John for that suggestion. And um, I'm going to um, give, um, <clears throat> excuse me, $2,500 to the 21 Hats Foundation or whatever you want to call it because um, you obviously need uh, <clears throat> some, some, like we're all business owners, we need finances to keep us going. So whether it's investing in a salesperson or writing a book or anything else, I mean, it's, it's uh, such an easy decision and you're going to accept it because I'm not going to take it back <laughs> and, it's, and it's recorded. But uh, John, thank you for that suggestion and uh, sorry for um, taking the mic, but I just, I couldn't not sit here and think about all the, uh, all the people, the panelists that, that help people, you know, just everyday folks that they've never met to uh, get through the pandemic. And one of the reasons I want to come here is just so I could thank those people in person. It was great to meet them. This has been a great, um, great couple of days. And uh, I hope it's the first of many contributions you get to keep this going to help others. Well, I can't thank you enough for that. You're making me emotional, too. That means so much. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you remain anonymous, <laughs> Dave. Um, but, but thank you for that. You have no idea what it means. And, and thank you all. <laughs> Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>